So you could go up to uh, two hours, or actually up to six hours. On one film? On one film. Six hours on one film? Yeah. How can you go six hours on one film? I don't know, the tape, just, the tape moves really slowly and it... The movie thing is like, the, the ones like this only for a half hour. The great big reels, the great big reels like this only for about 45 minutes, a half hour. You know the ones that they play in the movies, in the, in the theaters? Yeah. Okay, that's film though, and this is video. Here at the Fletcher Free Library, and also at Contoy's Auditorium, and also at the Church Street Center, and some other places around town, the Vermont Storytelling Festival. And we're going to show you what kinds of places it's going to be taking place inside. Come on. Hello, my name is Peter Burns, and I'll be your suave and sophisticated host for the storytelling here at 7.30 on Friday evening. There'll be a variety of different kinds of storytellers and different styles of stories. I'll know you enjoy it, so please come join me for this evening of stories. Thank you. Hi! Where's your teeny princesses? Nothing! <laughs> <laughs> I saw on TV real things. Pardon me, ma'am. May I ask your name? My name is Mrs. Dick Righteous. Mrs. Righteous, could you look into the camera and say hello to our viewers? Hi. Now, when you say nip womanhood in the bud, what do you mean, Mrs. Mrs. Righteous? Well, I mean that we are here. I have a statement. Do you mind if I read my statement? No, we are here to prevent the feminist blight of blue jeans, flat shoes, and female facial nudity. We expect to see an American dress code as the law of the land. We also support a new congressional group, HULA, the House Committee on Unladylike Activities. What I've done is made beauty you say, what is it? It's beauty. Now, I've had reporters say to me, look, Parenti, we can't editorialize the news. You understand? We're neutral. And if the president says one thing, we put that down, and we say, the president says, and if someone else says the other thing, we put that down, and we can compare the two. And I say to them, look, I don't want you to inject your editorial opinions into the news. I just wrote a whole book about how you already do that and you don't even realize it. That's number one. Number two is, it's not that I want you to editorialize, nor do I want you to pretend to a neutrality. I want you not to be objective, I want you to be truthful. And when the President of the United States gets up and he sets out a stream of words which at best are very one-sided interpretations and at worst are outright lies and you just report that to the American people without the slightest hint that there might be an alternative perspective then you're nothing but a mouthpiece for power and wealth and that's not objectivity what you've done is traded in uh, your, your commitment to accuracy and truth for an appearance of neutrality when the president in October 1984 gets up and he says, I'm going to support Social Security. And they put in the headlines, President Reagan in favor of Social Security. And you read this in the Washington Post on page one, and it's written like a straight story. And you read it in the New York Times on page one, and you hear it announced by Dan Rathers. And you sit there and you say, what am I in little Johnny Lollipop Wonderland? What is this? this and you don't mention the fact that for 20 years, this man has hated Social Security. He's gone after it with claw and fang and tooth and nail. And he equates it with welfare, which he detests and hates. And you don't even mention that. And the day after the election, he's already going after cost of living allowances and trying to squeeze it out and trim it down anyway, despite his pledges, you see. And I wrote uh, this script in Vermont last year, as a matter of fact, during uh, Christmas vacation at Stowe. And we got involved in a story of what would happen if Superman really got involved in the real problems of the world. And one of the main actions of the story is that in response to a letter writing campaign from students all across the country, 
about the breakdown in U.S.-Soviet relations, Superman yields to their request and vows in a speech at the United Nations that he's going to end the arms race. The time has come now to realize that there are no Superman, <laughs> that nobody can come down and help us single-handedly, but we have the next best thing. We have people like Pat Leahy in the Senate. Can you tell me if you're pleased with the turnout today? Oh, I'm ecstatic with the turnout. There's uh, so many more people than we ever expected to have. It's, uh, it's at least three times the number we expected. Really? Do that without advertising. That's great. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce to you the 38th President of the United States, Gerald R. Ford. I know, we will, we'll get to that. All right. We he can, gets <laughs> boring looking at us. That's yeah. what he's saying. He can well, only look at him. I know, I know. He does that very nicely, but why don't you... I mean, if you want to film them for a while... <laughs> okay. I'll stop, you know, but... He gets his name in the free press, it's all over. That's the right. Now he has an enormous ego. He thinks he's a great artist. Of, all kinds of... Put, put the camera on this guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's what happened. I didn't film that old North I mean, we're End trying to make this man into a now. household word. We have <laughs> people don't know who he is. Mr. President, I said, couldn't we give some consideration to the cessation of bombing of, uh, I think it was Cambodia or North Vietnam? And with that, he turned on me, and he had a way of turning on people, and he gave me five minutes worth and then he stood up, and obviously I stood up, and he said, Governor, he said, why don't you go back to Vermont, take care of your affairs, and let us take care of these affairs down here? And I said, yes, Mr. President. And I, out I went. <laughs> I'm practicing with a bunch of people who are going for their black belt, and I'm doing the same thing they are, so I would hope that at least they'd give me a brown belt. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got any pictures of you doing that, do you? I do. No? They've taken so many pictures, and they keep saying we're going to get them, we never do. So I, I keep bugging them. I did have some. Uh, that they took, the free press took one point, but I don't have them right here. Uh -huh. there. Yeah. Mr. Brown, obviously your country is suffering a, a major image problem here in the United States. This was evident to you this morning when you arrived and uh, were greeted by some 40 demonstrators out in front of our studios. Well, first of all, um, it's very difficult when uh, you're greeted with the continual type of questions such as, uh, how often do you beat your wife? And that's exactly what happens in our case. We have uh, people outside there demonstrating, accusing me of all sorts of things. Uh, they don't really know what I believe, they just assume that I'm a racist, uh, that my government supports racism and so on. <laughs> Translate that for me. <laughs> They're devils. <laughs> 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 How do you sense 
the the communication between you and the audience. You just imagine that you imagine this conversation is being heard by the whole world. Mm -hmm. Then that would that would give you some kind of ground to speak of basic things. That would be much. I would feel differently about communicating to the whole world than if I was just here with you alone. Well, it's true. And that's true. I mean, but okay. So you can imagine that you're here with me alone, but also with the whole world. Mm -hmm. Now look what we got over there. Yeah. But if we pretend it's not there, then <laughs> no need to pretend it's not there. It'll be a no need to pretend it's not there because it, what's over there is part of the larger consciousness of the world itself. Mr. Velvet, you are not. Uh, is, are you a recognized member of the press? I think you'll all recognize this as a communist trick to break up a meeting. I guess the uh, the best thing I can say about Channel 17 TV is that the folks in Burlington and surrounding communities ought to realize uh, what a special opportunity they have if they have people as dedicated as the folks that came to visit C-SPAN uh, who are concerned with you hearing what's going on in your local community and again making up your own mind as to what is correct and right and wrong and that's a unique opportunity that's not available to an awful lot of towns throughout the United States. So when you watch Channel 17, it may not always be as exciting as you'd like television to be, but it's important. 